Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hello, everybody. Today on the show, we have an old friend and colleague of mine, Mike Rinder. Mike was raised as a Scientologist from early childhood. He went on to serve as Scientology's international spokesperson and as the head of its Office of Special Affairs, otherwise known as OSA, also otherwise known as its Dirty Tricks Department, and was a member of the board of directors of Church of Scientology International from its creation in 1983 until he left in 2007. In fact, he says he escaped in 2007. Since renouncing Scientology, Rinder has become a prominent whistleblower against its abuses. He appeared in the HBO documentary Going Clear and co-hosted all three seasons of the Emmy award-winning show Leah Remini's Scientology and the Aftermath on a and Mike is currently the host of the new podcast, Exposing Scientology. In his latest book, A Billion Years, My Escape from a Life in the Highest Ranks of Scientology, is now available in paperback, and he'll be speaking about some of the additions to the new version of his book on the show today. Here is Mike now. It is my pleasure to have Mike Rinder with me today again, and it is so nice to speak with you. I know we've we've known each other for quite some time, uh, beginning in a very different context, (laughs) (laughs) and now now it's so lovely to be talking to you uh, about the work that you're doing. And I'm just noticing a a new friend in the background, your award um, that is just gleaming and gorgeous, and for a wonderful reason. Uh, and so I hope that you can talk about that as well, too. So if you don't mind just taking a moment and introducing yourself, and then we'll start schmoozing, as they say in the podcast business, <laughs> not really at all. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Rachel. Well, it's lovely to be back with you. My name, as you said, is Mike Rinda. I was raised a Scientologist and became a senior official in the Church of Scientology International for many years. I was on the board of Church of Scientology International from its creation in 1982, I think it was, until I escaped in 2007. For much of the time, I was the international spokesperson for Scientology. And for various periods during that time, I was the boss of the Office of Special Affairs, which is the uh, dirty tricks and legal and public relations branch of Scientology. I, as I said, I escaped in 2007 and subsequent to that have spent a good deal of time uh, trying to expose what I know are the abuses and uh, things within the secret world of Scientology that I believe uh, should be more broadly known. Yes, absolutely. Should be more broadly known. I I can't believe, I mean, because our eyes are going to be drawn to news stories and shows about cults. And still I'm asked, is Scientology a cult? And I'm thinking, where where have you been? Where have you been? <laughs> um, right? And and what is your understanding of a cult? <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Like, how could I don't want to seem incredulous and say, how could you not know? But I am trying to be patient with people who just don't have it on their radar, and I guess in the same way that that we do, and and all the more reason that these stories need to keep coming out. I couldn't agree with you more, Rachel. The lack of understanding of uh, the true nature of Scientology has changed fairly significantly over the last five years or 10 years. But for a long time, people just looked at Scientology and went, Oh, yeah, I know Scientology. That's Tom Cruise. And he's a really successful movie star, so I guess it's not bad. And that was the level of the general public perception of Scientology for a very long time. 
Very long time. Right. It it seemed to get a pass to a great degree, uh, which has been really frustrating because there's so much about it. And I know just from hearing uh, people's stories over the last 30 some odd years, you lived it and in different capacities. Um, I was speaking recently about the uh, the goons that were hired to follow me originally when I was harassed one of which uh, was Eugene Ingram, who uh, I remember uh, when I first met Eugene Ingram and he was wearing a sleeveless something, a shirt with tattoos and leaning on my car. And I'm 20 something and grew up in the Valley. I didn't even want to say, who are you? I wanted to say, what are you? (laughs) I, I hadn't met the species before, right? Who just had like crawled out from under a rock and was suddenly in front of me. And was ready for battle. And I thought, what did I do? And who are you? Why are you harassing me? And why do you feel so entitled to do this? So smug. He was very smug. And it's so interesting to come across these kinds of unsavory people who are hired by Scientology, which says a lot about Scientology. Yes. And let's not forget hired with tax-exempt money. I mean, back in that day, it was, Eugene Ingram's uh, was paid by not exempt money, but ultimately it became exempt. Scientology certainly wasn't paying taxes, but they weren't exempt from taxes at that time. Small distinction, but Eugene Ingram was the prototypical Scientology PI. He was like the first model that a lot of other models were built upon. As you said, it's not who are you, what are you. Or Rachel, he was straight out of central casting from a, a B or a C movie of, oh, what is a what is a badass PI look like? I mean, this guy wore white suits and black shirts and white ties to do press conferences in. When James Bond had a Lotus, he drove a Lotus. He drove the loudest, brightest, you know, flashiest cars. And he was he thought he was Magnum P.I. or James Bond or something. But let's go back to the serious side of this. That sort of activity is based on L. Ron Hubbard's writing, where he says that if there is anybody that is causing you trouble, use private investigators to start loudly investigating them. It's called an overt investigation in the world of Scientology. And it means make yourself loud and noisy. And Hubbard says that many people will simply back off by reason of the investigators showing up. Not that they've done anything wrong, just that they don't want the hassle. They don't want to have to deal with the BS that that uh, is bound to come their way now they've been notified they're somehow on Scientology's radar. And so plenty of people give up or walk away or become silent. And plenty of others don't ever speak out because they fear that that is going to happen to them and they just don't want it. They don't want it in their lives. So while it's cartoonish, it is also sinister. And it has a very exact purpose described by L. Ron Hubbard. And Scientology spends inordinate amounts of, as I said, tax-free or taxpayer-subsidized dollars on this sort of activity. And I don't think that there is another organization in the world that claims to be a religious entity that spends as much money on private investigators, lawyers, and harassing people as Scientology does. And I don't think it's even close. I don't think that there is Scientology and a second place that's here. There is Scientology and whatever the second place is, I don't know, is down there. Down there, right. Right. And uh, and again, you know, it says so much about the nature of the group, how when you work so hard to be intimidating, you have, I think, a lot to hide. And you are just hoping that people fall by the wayside because they don't want to deal with this anymore. And I did consider it for a minute. And I know that, you know, I, I know they've 
complaint to my board a number of times and more recently a complaint against me where it seemed to be spurred on by Scientology because they seemed to know about it before I was even in. I don't know if I told you this story. I may have mentioned it. I've mentioned it on the podcast, I think just once or twice. I got a, a call from the editor of Freedom Magazine, the, of course, ironically named Scientology Magazine, right? Right. Uh, and, uh, and the ironically named editor. Editor. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I didn't even think about that. Yes, spot on. Yes. And uh, he he wanted to get my statement about the complaint against me. And I said, what complaint against me? And then it got silent because I think he realized he jumped the gun. And he got there before I had been informed, which showed that they were somehow connected because he knew about it. Right. And so that's where that ended. Um, but the complaint lived on, unfortunately. And then they're just hoping that if I have, you know, if they make it enough of a pain in the tush, as we say, that I'll go away. But I always had in mind that for whatever I go through, it pales in comparison to what others, what you and others have gone through. And so I just stopped complaining about it and kept going. I mean, it fueled a fire. Well, you're one of the good ones, Rachel. And everybody who doesn't back away from Scientology is doing a great service to a lot of people and probably a lot of people that you will never know, never hear from, know absolutely nothing about. Because, you know, I get a lot of emails and text messages and I'm sort of relatively accessible to people in the world. And so many people have written to me and to Leah and to others engaged in this, this sort of battle to expose the abuses of Scientology who have said not only, you know, I saw this or you said that or I listened to a podcast or I watched The Aftermath, whatever it may be, and this helped me in in, in multitude of different ways. It, it goes all the way from I was suffering in an abusive relationship to I couldn't figure out what to do with my child who had gotten involved in Scientology to uh, they are taking my money to they won't stop sending me junk mail to like it's sort of everything, but. It is also oftentimes people who have never had any involvement with Scientology at all. And that is, uh, to me, especially satisfying. I know that you do far more than just deal with the, the world of Scientology abuses and trauma, but I don't. I, that, you know, that's sort of my specialty. And to hear from someone who was in the Jehovah's Witnesses or Nexium or uh, in an abusive relationship who writes and says, your story or what you said or the discussion you had with Leah or the discussion you had with John Atak or Steve Hassan or whatever opened my eyes and made me see my way out of my particular circumstance. That is especially gratifying to me. And Every single person who speaks out about the abuses of Scientology or any other abuses is affecting people that they don't know. And that's a great thing and, uh, and incredibly valuable. I agree. And I know that it sends a really good message about not letting the bullies win, which is a really good, I think, message overall for this world right now. And that there's strength in numbers. And the more people are out talking about it, sometimes people don't want to be the first. They don't want to be the first one to talk poorly or critically about something. But if they've heard someone else, and if they've heard someone who was high up, someone like you who can say, I, I know this for a fact. In fact, I was generating some of the things for a good reason, right? It had it it had a lofty reason at the time. Um, wasn't like a Eugene Ingram who does it just for the you know fun of the, the power money. of it and the money, <laughs> right? Exactly, right. Yeah, we 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 were never working for the money, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. 
Oh, no, the numbers are crazy. Just what people get, got paid or didn't and all the slave labor. Yes. I'm wondering about what's happening now. But before we get into what's happening now, I I would love to hear about because some people have said to me, you know, they have loved ones who feel impenetrable. They're involved in Scientology or in a different kind of cult group. They're involved in multi-level marketing and they're just losing their shirt, but they still, you know, can't be talked away from it. They are involved in some self-help thing that's making them really disengage from their mind, from their life, but they, I can't reach them. And I know when you're a spokesperson for something, you also have to be kind of on send, so to speak, like you're, you're out there on the offense and might seem impenetrable. And what is that about that just makes you go, go, go and be impervious to arguments? And and then what starts to, to kind of dissipate that icy, that icy wall that has come up? I mean, I know these are big questions, but this is something that people bring to me a lot. Okay. Well, let's start with the beginning. What makes you impervious? If you can persuade someone that there is an answer to the problem or problems that they have. And whether whether it's true or not is not important. It's whether you can persuade someone to believe that it's true is what's important. Because to the rest of the world, it, it's foolishness, idiocy. To that person, if they believe that it is true, The cognitive dissonance that goes along with a belief about something as powerful as what you get in the world of Scientology. I can't speak for everybody, everywhere else and all these others, but I have spent a lot of time talking to Nixon people, Jehovah's Witness people, Mormons, and a few others. Scientology tells you that your eternal salvation is at stake, and that there is only one way to achieve that eternal salvation, and that is through Scientology. But there are a couple of very clever things that Hubbard did with respect to that, one of which is to tell people that it's not just something that helps you. It is something that you can use to help others. And that is a... (laughs) You know, people have the idea that that people get sucked into to cults are all needy, homeless people, or street people, or dumb, or something. In fact, by my in my experience, the people that have gotten sucked into Scientology, other than those that were raised in it as children, are generally pretty intelligent and capable and smart. And the button that is used with them is being able to help their friends and family in addition to helping themselves, but helping their friends and family is a very, very important part of what Scientology purports to offer. And secondly, Hubbard started with a brilliant premise that is still used today to suck people into Scientology, and that is his construct of the reactive mind. He claimed that the reactive mind is a subconscious mind that causes all of your irrationality, all of your phobias, all of your illnesses. Everything that is wrong with you is caused by this thing called the reactive mind, something that you have absolutely no responsibility for, you have no control over. There is nothing you can do about it except for one thing. By Hubbard's means of getting rid of your reactive mind. It is a very, very appealing concept that everything that you do wrong and everything that goes wrong in your life isn't your fault. It's funny because Scientology then switches after Dianetics into the complete opposite. And you get the next control mechanism, which is You are responsible for everything that ever happens to you, and you are the causation of that, and therefore you're to blame. Uh, You know, if, if, if someone comes and punches you in the face, it's not that they're a belligerent asshole. It's that you did something bad to deserve that. But 
I know I get, I tend to ramble a lot, Rachel. So shut me up if I'm oh, rambling. No, this is good. Go, but, keep going. But you, if you can convince people that there is something that is this important, that the very future of every man, woman, and child on earth depends on your participation on what people do in Scientology, which is a thing that is hammered into every Scientologist, literally in the Keeping Scientology Working Policy Letter written by L. Ron Hubbard that every Scientologist can basically quote verbatim, and I can still quote verbatim 15 years later. This has an incredibly powerful grip because there is another construct that Hubbard developed in Scientology, which is another very clever thing, where he said that your survival or right and wrong or decisions that you make should be weighed against what he called the eight dynamics of existence. And these are the, this sort of... um it's kind of hard to describe in English <laughs> normal words, but he said it's the thrusts towards survival. And the number one is yourself, and number two is your family, and number three is groups, and number four is mankind, and number five is living things, and number six is inanimate objects, and number seven is the spiritual world, and number eight is the is infinity. And that you compare decisions about what's good or bad against what is the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. But for a Scientologist, there is this huge foot on the pedal of the third dynamic, which is groups. Because every Scientologist is a part of the group of Scientology. So that dynamic out of the eight has Scientology as a part of it. Hubbard says, and all Scientologists believe, that Scientology is good for everything and everybody. So effectively, the decision is weighted entirely. If Scientology is good for all of mankind and good for families and good for individuals and good for animals and spirits and whatever, then what's good for Scientology is ultimately going to be the determining factor of what is a right decision or a wrong decision, a good decision or a bad decision. So every decision that a Scientologist makes is weighted 100% to what's good for Scientology. So if they hear things about Scientology that are bad, it doesn't matter if they're true or not, they get rejected instantly because that's not good for Scientology. And Hubbard says that, you know, if it's in the media, that's just merchants of chaos, part of the conspiracy. There are so many layers to this that it is very, very difficult to penetrate when someone has become a believer. I think that the only way to do so is to offer that person complete support and tell them that you will always be there for them no matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances, that plants a seed. And we have heard many stories over the years of people who had a sibling or a parent or someone that they went to school with or something that planted that seed very early on. And as they started to sort of wake up, they came back to that and it was a, it was a lifeline for them. And the second thing is to not tell them that they're stupid, not tell them that they're wrong, not tell them that they are foolish, but to try and use the only things that they believe in at that point, which is the words of L. Ron Hubbard. Because there are some quotes from L. Ron Hubbard that all Scientologists know, they just kind of tend to ignore them. Like he says, look, don't listen. 
And what is true for you is what is true for you. And don't take uh, what people say, read a book. Well, that could include a book not written by L. Ron Hubbard, and that it is important to view all information and make decisions based on the available information. So if those things that Hubbard said can be used to plant a, a another seed, look, I don't think that it has ever happened that someone has walked into a room with a dedicated Scientologist and walked out of the room with someone who has just walked away. I just don't think that's ever happened. I think that I, I analogized this the other day to there is a scale, and it starts with Scientology and your belief in Hubbard here and your doubts up there. And drip, 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 until the drips, all these little doubts, all these little incidents, all these little things have accumulated. And then there is a final drip that tips the balance. And at that point, that person is ready to, if not walk away entirely, start looking and going on to Googling Scientology or looking at forbidden TV shows or whatever. Yeah, right. A couple things about that. It's interesting with the drip, drip, drip. It, there's another analogy that I often use about how within cults, there's often what I call trickle-down narcissism. That it goes through the ranks uh, and people sort of take on that persona that the leader has, but also this whole idea, like within, when you're in a relationship with someone who has a narcissistic bent, you have to make decisions that work for them, that make them look good, that further their goals. Same thing here, that the decision that's right for you is the decision that's best for Scientology. And, you know, i.e. best for L. Ron Hubbard and his goals, uh, and then Miscavige. And so, uh, you know, the idea also that you have something drummed into you, like about the reactive mind, and then it all switches. I do think that adds to this kind of interesting and dangerous dissociation. When you're in a like an environment where suddenly the rules change, but not just change, but flip 180, I think you just suspend disbelief, you suspend critical thinking, you're like this doesn't actually make sense. So I'm just going to go along for this ride. And just now this is my new, my new thought, because it needs to be if I'm going to continue here. And so I think that it's hard to then feel grounded. I also think with learning to deal with the reactive mind when you first get in, yes, I'm sure it feels very good to know that you can gain control over something that is the source of all of your issues and the world's issues. At the same time, part of the reason that I deal with and help people who have come out of cults who thought they had learned how to manage their emotions but didn't, they just learned how to deflect and resist them and ignore them, they come flooding back. And so the healthy way to deal with a reactive mind is to understand why you have it, why it's necessary, why it's informing you, what it's informing you of, how it's your safety net, but also still how to control it, how to absorb an emotion, how to address it, then how to manage it. And then I think you feel a lot more capable. You don't have to run away from it and hide in the way that I think Scientology offers and most cultic groups offer people, but it doesn't equip you you know, which I think is really disheartening, especially after you've spent so much time and so much money learning skills that you think you can apply in your life, but end up really keeping you from, I think, feeling capable. And you have to learn it after you leave. Yes, you're exactly right, Rachel. And this this idea of the switcheroony is pretty remarkable in Scientology because, you know, the big objective of Scientology is to clear the planet, eradicate everybody's reactive mind. The ultimate realization that brings about this state of clear in Scientology 
is the realization that you were just mocking up or creating yourself your reactive mind. That it, it's not really real. It's just your projection of all this stuff. So it starts out with convincing you that you have a reactive mind, then getting you to pay to get rid of it. And then when you finally reach the point of getting rid of it, the realization is you didn't have one in the first place because it was just created by you, even though you didn't know about it before. Anyway, the, the insanity of this stuff is quite difficult to comprehend when you're outside of that bubble. But, you know, I've read a, a, a few books about this thing that happens in cults where something is posited as being an absolute truth and then it is proven to be not true. And, and the classic examples are in the Jehovah's Witnesses where they predicted Armageddon was going to happen on X date. And back back in the, uh, you know, 1900s, early 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, they were giving exact dates all the way up until I think 1973 or something. And all these people would gather on the mountaintop and wait for the heavens to open and hellfire and brimstone to pour down and nothing would happen. And the leaders of the Jehovah's Witnesses told them that they were just being tested by God, or they came up with some new story each time. But what happened was a certain percentage of people at that point gave up in disgust and walked away, but not a big percentage. And the ones that remain became even more radicalized and even more convinced that they were on the right path because they had an, an excuse that was offered to them that they absorbed and then went okay we go and this is the this is what happens in Scientology too you know Hubbard said when the squirrels start to scream it's proof that we are doing well so in the minds of Scientologists, when going clear comes out, that is proof of how good Scientology is doing. They don't look at the, I mean, they're forbidden to watch the, the movie anyway or read the book, but even if they do, they look at it and go, yeah, this is just the SPs, the suppressive persons ranting about Scientology, and the louder they rant and the more coverage they get and the bigger the deal is, the greater the proof is that we are right and that Hubbard is right and that we have to rededicate our efforts and give more money and get more involved and try harder because look at the state of this world. It is overrun by people trying to stop Scientology and the only hope that mankind has. So we got to do more and work harder. And Scientology, there is no doubt, it is shrinking in numbers drastically. But it's not shrinking in the amount of money that it's taking in because the number of people is getting less, but those people are more fervent and they are giving more to the cause, more money, more time. And it makes Scientology a formidable enemy because as it dwindles in size, it becomes more radical in nature and has the same or more resources available. I mean, Scientology has at least $4 billion, billion with a B. And in fact, I've been saying that for some time, and eventually, uh, Scientology's lawyer, Monique Yingling, had to admit on CBS this morning that, yes, it is billions of dollars. And it's not that they don't care about, they are required to spend that money to protect Scientology. And in the minds of a Scientologist, that means destroy those who are enemies of Scientology. 
And enemies of Scientology are defined in Scientology as anybody who says anything we don't like. It's not like they're real enemies. It can be a grandma who says that she disagrees with her grandson giving all their money to Scientology. That person, in the mind of a Scientologist, is an enemy, a grandma. Incredible. And also, if you think about having billions, then maybe you would think I should pay someone who's working 100 hours a week (laughs) more than 30 bucks. But no, it goes to this arsenal. It goes to stockpiling their legal weaponry. And that says something also about how much it really doesn't care about the individual people there who it's using for its purposes. Right. And Rachel, David Miscavige and Hubbard before him are motivated by power. There are a lot of people out there who go, oh, yeah, this guy's motivated by money. He's probably stashing away millions of dollars in various places. He doesn't need to stash anything away. He can snap his fingers and have anything he wants without having any personal money and therefore no personal taxes. What motivates him and what motivated Hubbard before him? was power. And my definition of power in this context is the ability to get someone to do something that is against their best interest. If you can get people to do things that are clearly not in their own best interest, but are in the best interest of the person that is getting you to do it, you have complete control, and power over them. And that is what defines Scientology. That's why you have Sea Org members that work 100 hours or more a week for $46 and live and are treated like absolute shit. And that is power. That is control over people. That's why you have people in Scientology that bankrupt themselves to give money to Scientology based on false promises, not just about what they will achieve in Scientology, but lies about what they're spending their money on. Oh, we're educating poor, underprivileged children in Africa. Oh, we're resolving the crime problem. Oh, we're dealing with with the only effective uh, rehabilitation of drug addicts on planet Earth. And, you know, all of this stuff is presented bought hook, line, and sinker, and people give over money to the point of going bankrupt. And that is that is serious power. Serious power, right. And people who use that money to give to Scientology instead of getting medical care, instead of paying for college for their children, and just instead of everything, really everything. And I think going back to this idea that, you know, you can be tapped into if it is to help not only yourself, but to help others. This I, The techniques that people are, are taught, like the touch assist and other things, it can feel really good. If I felt like I could learn something that I could use to really help people with just a touch of my fingers or something, um, yeah, I say, yes, please. But in in the meantime... It can make you, I think, be blinded to noticing really what is happening here, that you are sacrificing things that you should have never been made to sacrifice in order to be helping. But I know some people who talked about going out to disasters as part of a Scientology team said a lot of time was spent taking photos and wearing the T-shirts and being in front of the van that had the thing on it. You know, it was PR. And that's where it it all kind of crumbles in my mind. Like, what are you really doing this for? And who are you doing this for? Right. Well, we, you know, I have talked a lot about this because it's a particularly sore subject to me. You are correct. Uh, Those activities are entirely photo ops. Once the photos and video is taken to use to show at the next Scientology event, it you know whoever the ten or fifteen people were that flooded in to save the victims of Hurricane Katrina, they are gone uh, once the video footage is shot. And 
interestingly, uh, this ties into this problem of Scientology and its tax exempt status. In the United Kingdom, there is a, a different system where they have a thing called a charity commission. And that charity commission is charged with the responsibility of making a determination whether any organization that applies for charitable status, i.e. tax exemption, uh, must prove that it is a public benefit. It, it is of benefit to the public at large which is the theory of tax exemption even in the United States. The theory of tax exemption is we won't tax organizations that are doing the work of the government. The government should be looking after the people. They should be providing services to them. They should be assisting them when they, they are knee in need or old or whatever. And if an organization provides that service, in lieu of the government, we're not going to tax them as well because tax money is supposed to be spent to accomplish that. Anyway, in the UK, Scientology has never been able to prove that it actually serves a charitable purpose. Despite the fact that David Miscavige and me and other people flew to the UK, that Tom Cruise went there to pitch Tony Blair's assistance, and we had the Charity Commission come to the Scientology headquarters and made a big presentation of all these wonderful videos at blah, 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 and they saw right through it and didn't buy it at all. Now, that's a system we should have in the United States, in fact, in every country, but it is the best sort of example and proof that Scientology is constructed and operated for the benefit of Scientology. That is its reason to exist. Its, its reason to exist is not to provide uh, public benefit to the world. If that was the case, uh, they would spend some of those billions of dollars on feeding the indigent or really opening schools or whatever, you know, having food kitchens. I don't know. Even the, the often most derided religious organizations, like the Catholic Church, that, that gets people all up in their business about what they're engaged in with good reason. But if you go to a Catholic Church and you want to come in out of the cold, they won't throw you out. They won't hose you down on the sidewalk. They do operate food kitchens for people. They do have programs that help. And it was a big shock to me, Rachel, believe it or not, when I left the Sea Org and when I had my son, Jack, and he went to kindergarten at the local kindergarten that is just near our house, and it happens to be associated with a church, a Methodist church. And so we would go there and go to the events that they held for Christmas and Thanksgiving and whatever, and the kids would do their plays and, you know, and the pastor of the church and the sort of volunteers of the church would stand up and give everybody a briefing about what they'd been doing in the community and how they had found homes for X number of people, and how they had installed, you know, toilets for homeless people in Toppen Springs, and how they'd done this, and how they'd done that. And there was no videos. There was no rah-rah cheering in the halls. There was just these lovely people standing up and saying, so we accomplished this in this, you know, in the last six months, and we did this, and we're very happy about that, and we're very happy about this. And if you'd like to volunteer to help us, please let us know after the fact. And it was like, oh my God, these are just normal, real people who are doing things because they're good people to help people who need help. And there's no demand for money there's no there's no there's slick videos there's no nothing and this is what scientology does not have and it's 
very, very apparent when you stand outside of that bubble of belief and look at what goes on inside that bubble of belief, and you go, wow, this doesn't bear much resemblance to what you would believe is a religious charitable organization. Right, right, absolutely. And I want to mention something that you said briefly at the beginning, that there are a lot of unsung heroes in this story. There are a lot of people who have not come forward using their name, using their face for fear, or also because maybe their family is still involved and they'll be disconnected from. And so I do want to pay tribute to all the people who have shared their their information um, from behind the scenes and also to the people who have taken the risk to, to share it from in front, in front of the camera. And I wanted to ask about your work coming up, you know, what you're going to be doing and what sort of the new form of the show is going to be like. And also, I know there's a lot of commotion now happening in Hollywood, out on the streets. There's a lot happening right now with a groundswell, uh, which I love. I love, I, I, I remember years ago going to a a conference. It may have even been, I don't know if it was as far back as the Cult Awareness Network before it was Scientology. Maybe it was American Family Foundation. I don't remember, but I remember Anonymous was there. <laughs> and I thought, who are these brave souls uh, who are coming forward? And I was so excited for their whatever their reasoning was and whether it was aligned with why I would have been upset, who knows what, but still, they were willing to go toe-to-toe, face-to-face. And I just wonder if you see that now happening too with the internet and what's happening with the next generation. So first about your show and what can people look forward to with that and what you're seeing as a trend maybe to get the word out about Scientology. Well, it is a little in flux right now what the next thing will be. Lear and I started doing um, YouTube videos that we basically turned into podcasts I'm sure you're aware that Leah filed a lawsuit over the harassment that happened and the harassment in particular from the Aftermath show and then subsequently with the two podcast companies that we were working with. So I can't exactly say for various different reasons. I do have the paperback edition of my book coming out you know, very shortly, uh, which has an update of what happened since the time of writing the book and it being released and what Scientology did to try and stop it, et cetera, et cetera. It's a new afterword. And in the back, it has a, a fairly lengthy afterword, actually. I, uh, there are a couple of other things Rachel, I'm sorry to be so vague. There are a couple of other things that are in the works that I can't talk about yet. Oh, that's fine. No, vague is fine. I just, I think people want to know if things are happening. It sounds like things are, which is exciting. Yes. They are definitely happening. And there is uh, a whole new world of things that have, that are sort of, I don't know, the next generation of activists. You know, you mentioned Anonymous. Now they're not anonymous, now they're TikTok. And the TikTok people have come to the the forefront, uh, at least in Hollywood, of preventing people from going into Scientology in the test center there on Hollywood Boulevard and bringing awareness to a generation that I certainly don't reach. I'm not reaching the 13 to 25-year-olds in any way, shape, or form. Those people are, and they are doing a great public service by educating that age group in particular to just how weird Scientology is. Look, these TikTokers, for the most part, had no experience in Scientology. They've sort of learned as they go along. But what they are doing is that they are showing that the world of Scientology is this weird world. I mean, Jessica Palmadessa, who sort of has led this charge, and she kind of isolated some of these people. And there's this particular guy. And Angel is a really nice-looking guy. And she is always sort of trying to have conversations with this guy. And he just does the Scientology... The stare down. 
<laughs> Blank. Yes. Never says a word. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself is educating these 13 to 25 year olds. You don't want to end up like that. Every person that looks at this goes, well, he's a good looking guy. At least he could say to her, thank you for the compliment or, you know, have some interaction. And he knows it's going out to the world. And even though he knows it's going out to the world, he can't say anything. And while that isn't the, the level of, well, let me expose to you the writings of L. Ron Hubbard and the esoterics of the Dianetics and OT levels and X, Y, and Z, it is creating an image and a picture in the mind of young people who are on TikTok that Scientology is crazy stuff. And you don't want to get involved in it. And that is astonishingly important and absolutely invaluable. I mean, they are doing something that has enormous value. It's not what I do. Like, I can't go stand out on the street and do that. I don't want to go stand out on the street and do that. I have a different perspective and a different message to bring to the equation and different information and different understanding about stuff, I see that as, as enormously valuable. It is. And I wanted to say, too, that there are a lot of people I work with, a lot of people you've come across, and maybe this was something true for you, too. When you come out of a group like Scientology, it's very hard to know how to socialize. It's very hard to know how to have or engage in small talk. Because Everything is of the utmost importance, and you're supposed to be getting across Scientology messages, but just knowing how to get along in the world gets atrophied or just is never taught if you're raised in it. So I do think that this encapsulates something that for a lot of people, they say that it is sometimes not permanent, but a kind of a temporary handicap where they don't know how to relate. And that they they have learned through courses to cut off from any kind of interaction or just showing that you're impacted at all by the person talking to you, which really does isolate you. And I'm glad that that's being filmed. Yes. And, and you know, I can't help but think when I watch that, okay, what is a 15-year-old that is watching this going to think? They just have got to look at it and go, oh, that's some crazy stuff going on there in Scientology. And if there is one of those who does not get ensnared in Scientology because they watched a TikTok video, that's a good thing. And there is a lot more than one. There are uh, There's a whole generation being educated on this and... I support that 100%. I have said many times in the past that I don't believe, you know, it's sort of this thing that I was saying to you earlier, Rachel, about in the mind of a cult member, the screaming uh, critics are proof that they are succeeding and make them get more hardened and convinced and radicalized. And that has generally been my view of the protest kind of activities that have happened. Even back to Anonymous, make no mistake, the fact that Anonymous brought so much attention to the subject is astonishing. I don't think that the protests outside the Scientology buildings got a single person out of Scientology because I know how they look at that stuff. It doesn't sow seeds of doubt in their mind. It convinces them that they need to work harder. But there are other benefits to this. And that's what I'm saying is I think the protests, if anybody thinks that that is going to get people out of Scientology, is a misplaced view based on my experience. The fact of bringing attention to the subject is astonishingly important. 
And the fact of what these people, the TikTokers in Hollywood are doing, showing what a real Scientologist looks like out in the wild, caught on Hollywood Boulevard on their iPhone, is doing a huge service to a lot of people. So, you know, not my thing, but I see it as incredibly valuable and important, and I will keep trying to do my thing, which those people can't do. They don't know the the inner workings of Scientology. They haven't experienced L. Ron Hubbard. They don't have ever worked with David Miscavige. There's a whole lot of people out there who just happen to, like you said, uh, want to speak up about something that they think is wrong, but don't really have a huge amount of information about it. But, but that's valuable too. Absolutely. Right. I mean, I think for you to know that you can talk about being in the presence of L. Ron Hubbard, what he was like in person, David Miscavige in person. I mean, the, the behind the scenes is incredibly important, just getting a flavor for what things were like and what those players, what those people are like and what was driving Scientology and what it was like to work in the you know, Office of Special Affairs or run it and what those ops were like. I mean, that that is something, yes, that people out there or people on TikTok w- don't know and I guess, thankfully, won't have experienced yes. it, right? It's a good You're thing. You're exactly right, right Rachel. Thankfully, <laughs> they haven't got a clue. Right? Yes, <laughs> one, one hope. But yes, I think that they're speaking the language of people of their generation, which is really exciting and giving voice and not being afraid. And I I remember starting in this field being very afraid to speak up. And I remember being told, don't use Scientology, don't speak about it, don't say that it's a cult, don't use the C word. And so there were so many prohibitions early on where I couldn't do the kind of education and prevention that I wanted to, I had to be circumspect. I had to kind of beat around the bush. I, it was just not direct enough, but I had to protect myself. And now I love the boldness and the fearlessness that comes, I think, from there being a groundswell, it comes from people like you coming forward and speaking the truth about it. And then people can jump on that, you know, but there need to be the brave soldiers to begin with. And so I really value that part of you. Anything else you want? us to know about what's happening or what to watch out for. And I can't wait to actually read the addendum on your book, by the way. I think that, honestly, the future of Scientology looks dim and is getting dimmer by the day. And that eventually the agencies that should be restraining the abuses of Scientology will step forward and do what needs to be done. Uh, Those wheels turn very, very, very slowly. Uh, But they also are pretty inexorable once they get in motion. And they have been put in motion and continue in motion. and. I am of the firm belief that we will see action that will put at least the the most egregious conduct of Scientology uh, firmly in the spotlight and firmly in the crosshairs of the agencies that that should be stopping this stuff from happening. The the destruction of families and taking people's money and covering up abuses and, you know, not allowing people to report to law enforcement and all of that sort of stuff. You can't keep doing that forever brazenly. And the sort of crazy thing about Scientology is it can't change. Because it's all based on the the works and writings of L. Ron Hubbard. So if L. Ron Hubbard says you do noisy investigations, Scientology will continue to do noisy investigations, no matter how much bad PR it causes, no matter how many flaps get generated as a result, because that's what Hubbard says to do. And that is, in some ways, a wonderful thing. Because 
they just keep doing it. You know, if they stopped some of these things, it would make it far more difficult for these agencies to be able to keep moving forward. But they can't stop them. So they're sort of helpless, caught in their own runaway train of self-destruction that eventually is going to go off the cliff. And I just feel and see the momentum building in that. Because, you know, all of these things in the world or all of these things where you start talking about social issues like gay rights or whatever, you see this pattern of, you know, it starts out with everybody's against it. And then a few voices speak up and then more voices speak up. And then eventually you sort of reach a tipping point where it becomes acceptable now starts out being unacceptable, then it becomes acceptable. And then the next step after that is it becomes unacceptable to be anti-gay. And when you reach that point, that's when politicians start piling in and going, oh, I can make political hay out of this. Oh, I can do something with this to forward my career and my political aims by trashing Scientology or going after Scientology. and. When that happens, that's basically, you're very close to the end. And we are starting to see some of those things. I don't know if you've seen this member of parliament in the United Kingdom who is calling for uh, an actual full-blown inquiry into Scientology. I'm sure that you saw what went down in the mayor's race in Los Angeles, where shitting on Scientology became a, a sort of a competition Who could shit on Scientology the best? And when you get to that point, you start then getting law enforcement agencies, the Department of Justice, the immigration people, the, you know, all of these different agencies that then start going, well, maybe there is something that we should be doing here. And, you know, you speak about the people who have done the work to expose a lot of this and bravely stood up. And there are some sort of giants in the the history of this battle to expose Scientology. And everybody who comes after stands on their shoulders, but gains strength from that foundation that they built and keeps building on it and building on it and building on it. And, you know, if it hadn't been for Lawrence Wright and going clear, the Aftermath show would never have happened. But if it hadn't been for Joe Childs and Tom Tobin and their groundbreaking reporting in the the St. Pete Times, going clear would never have happened. You know, you go back and back and back and it builds and builds and builds. And honestly, today, the reputation of Scientology sucks. I mean, I don't think that there is any normal person in the world that looks at Scientology and goes, oh, yeah, that's, you know, yeah, it's okay. I I don't really, people look at it and go, either it's weird or it's evil or both, weirdly evil. And that has been brought about by this massive level of exposure that has happened, like I said, all the way back to Paulette Cooper. I mean, now there is a woman with courage. Oh, my God. And she set the stage for, you know, Richard Leiby and writers at the at the Clearwater Sun. And then, it, and it goes on and on. And the field keeps growing and getting bigger. And as there are more people speaking and there are more shows and there's more articles and more cartoons and more jokes on SNL and John Oliver and everywhere else, you change the public perception and pretty soon it becomes, it used to be, nobody wanted to criticize Scientology. Now, a lot of people want to criticize the abuses of Scientology. Soon, it will become completely unacceptable to not criticize the abuses of Scientology. Right. I love that. I love that trend, that arc that you're highlighting. It is a really beautiful thing. 
And yes, it would be so nice. I think, you know, I remember the transition from not having to explain that Scientology wasn't Christian science, because that's what <laughs> people would ask me. Oh, do you mean Christian science? No. So then I, I would talk about Scientology and I'd say, comma, and I'm not talking about Christian science. Can we just get that question out of the way so we can move forward? All the snake in the mailbox people. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yes. Send it on. Exactly. Exactly. By the way, I still, I check my mailbox before I put my hand <laughs> in. Ever since that story. Uh, wow. Yeah, that left a mark. Um, but it is quite incredible to me that they still have tax exempt status. And I just, I don't know what will reverse that because uh, I know they lost it, then they got it back and it's time. It's time for that to go back. And we'll see because you're talking about agencies stepping in. That's a big one that needs to step in. Right. And, you know, as soon as some politicians decide that you know, you get someone on the House Ways and Means Committee or the Senate Ways and Means Committee or one of the IRS oversight committees who gets uh, um, a bug in their ear about this subject, that's when you start getting action. And, you know, hopefully that will happen. And I firmly believe it will because I firmly believe that it doesn't matter who you are or how much money you have. If you're doing bad and evil things, you will eventually get brought to account. And I might be um, hand gloss or Pollyanna. Pollyanna, but. But still, yeah, it's okay. I sort of have to keep believing that because it's what keeps me going. Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Well, I. I want to be mindful of your time and I and I know that you have a lot to do and I I wish you well with all the things that are in the works that we will come to hear about and find out more about and I can't wait. Uh and uh to wish you and your family well in the new year. I hope it's a wonderful year for all of you. Thank you so much Rachel and the same back at you and I appreciate you taking the time to talk and it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. One more thing before you go. It's always so good to talk to Mike Rinder. It's so nice that we get to commiserate now being on the same team. It was most definitely difficult to be on opposing teams, so to speak. Although what Mike was doing was he was doing his job. And as he talked about, he really felt really compelled to do this. He was saving the planet. He was saving his and other people's eternal salvation. Everything was at stake. And that's going to drive you to be at times militant, even belligerent because you feel it's for the greater good. And I think it takes a lot of bravery to just say, I was involved in a cultic group, and then I realized it was a cult, and I left. That's big enough. But to say, I was involved in a cult. In fact, I was the spokesperson for that cult, and I also helped to manage its dirty tricks department. And now I want everyone to know what this group is up to, that takes a lot of courage. I'm really respectful of that part of Mike Rinder. What is important, too, is something that he mentioned. He talked about this very core idea of Scientology is that you are supposed to get rid of your reactive mind. You're supposed to see that it is the thing that gets in your way and you're not supposed to have it. Now, as with anything, if you look at it in the gray, if we see this as something that is sometimes a helpful thought, that there's some people who might react in too great a way to something, and so their emotions feel out of control, their emotions turn out to be something that debilitate them, that overwhelm them, and they feel like they can't manage them, yes, then it's good to look at that. 
But as with anything done in the extreme and across the board 100%, if you get rid of something across the board, especially if it's your reactive mind, then yes, you are gaining more access to a level of self-control, but you're also robbing yourself of having access to a whole variety of emotions, even in small ways, that help you get a read on what's happening right then in your life, what's happening to you, what's being triggered inside of you, and all of these parts of you through evolution are created for a reason. Your emotions all serve a purpose. Again, sometimes they get out of control and it is good to figure out how to manage them. But you never want to be involved in something that tells you not to feel anymore. And also something that says you're not allowed to feel anything bad anymore. You're not allowed to feel angry. You're not allowed to get jealous. You're not allowed to feel resentful. These are the things that help you know you're being taken advantage of. These are the things that help you know that you're being mistreated. These are the emotions that guide you, that can protect you, that can alert you. And so when an organization of any sort says, you need to get rid of these, you need to ask why. And if you ask people in the organization, you'll get the answer that is the answer that really mm, is probably not accurate. And they'll say it's for your benefit. But when you think about it and you ask yourself, hmm, I wonder if there's more to this. I wonder if there's another reason. You might want to consider that the reason is so that they can mistreat you, so they they can abuse you, so they can use you. And they can guarantee then you won't get upset about it. Or at least you won't admit that you're upset about it because then you'll be letting on that you're not a good member of this group. You don't really get it, that you haven't done the work. And so there are actually a lot more people within cultic groups that are way more upset about what's happening to them than they let on. Same thing within controlling relationships. People will often seem a lot more fine than they're feeling inside because they know if there's a value placed on seeming fine, they don't want to be berated or put down for not seeming fine. And then they're stuck. They're stuck really not being able to express and act on the feelings that they're having that are alerting them to something being wrong here. It is much better to learn how to address your feelings how to interpret them, how to understand the trigger, how to figure out to how to manage them and not be afraid of them. I wonder how much L. Ron Hubbard may have been afraid of his own impulses, afraid of his own feelings, and that's why he had to figure out how to control them and then raised the level of that to a high value, in fact, the core value, that he then passed along to the people around him so they could be devoid of those feelings, and then they wouldn't be as upset, too, with needing to make all those sacrifices, needing to be so exhausted, needing to be separate from their loved ones, needing to not have their mental health or physical health cared for, taken care of, And then, as I mentioned to Mike, so many people come out of these situations feeling really ill-equipped to handle their emotions. One of the challenges, though, when you come out of a relationship like this or a cult like this is to do something even before you can get help with your emotions. And it's to be able to address this idea that your emotions are bad or your emotions don't matter or they're a sign of weakness. You need to start by realizing that there is a purpose for them. And you have to start by realizing that 
it's actually a sign of strength that you can say, this is how I'm feeling. It's not a sign of weakness. I want to support anyone out there who, again, is coming out of these situations feeling kind of numb, feeling disconnected, feeling disconnected from themselves, feeling disconnected from others, and encouraging you to get help with not being afraid of feeling. And there is an additional fear that people have that because they have stuffed away so much anger or resentment or other feelings over such a long period of time, they are afraid that once they open the door to those feelings, they won't be able to control them. They will just take over. That lets me know a lot of the time just how many times people were feeling angry or resentful or sad or something and couldn't express it. How much emotion has accumulated over time to the point where people are afraid of actually feeling all of it all at once. But know that it might feel a bit out of control at first because you haven't learned how to manage them and, or you're out of practice. But get support while you're going through this. You never have to go through this alone. Contact other former members. Speak to a therapist. Take care of these emotions in little bits. Let it out a little bit at a time. It's actually possible to do. And then you don't have to be afraid of it. And then you get to have all of your feelings again, which is something that everybody should be able to enjoy. And everyone should be able to learn how to manage and be given the tools to manage it so you don't have to spend your life afraid of feeling. Take good care. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at indoctrination podcast and for twitter find us at at underscore indoctrination we love hearing from you too so send us an email at indoctrination show at gmail.com and for more updates on the show visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination